Welcome to the IFO Nightly Show. I'm your host, Tung Dang, and this is a particularly exciting episode for me because I'll get to reunite with an old acquaintance of mine. He and I used to rub shoulders quite a bit when I was in university because he's none other than the Raja of RMIT, the Kaiser Supervisor, the Commander-in-Chief of the Hanoi Campus, Mr. Philip Dowler. Hi, Tung. How it's are you It's a pleasure. <laughs> Please be seated. Thank you. Mr. Dowler is the former president of the Australian Chamber of Commerce, Vietnam, and the head of the Hanoi campus of RMIT University. He is experienced in liaising with the government, public sector agencies, and industry. Mr. Dowler is a graduate of the Australian. He holds a master degree in commerce granted by the University of New England and participates in postgraduate studies in education and risk management. I mean, I've always been thoroughly impressed, and this is, uh, this is something that hasn't changed, is your A game in tailoring. I mean, you always, you always bring it. Well, well I'm sure you're, you're the influence. You know? so <laughs> when I saw that we were being interviewed today, I had to make sure I was smart, I was bright, and I was fashionable to match you. <laughs> okay, I'm digging like the, the turquoise blazer and the kind of like the, the rock star outfit underneath. It's, it's a nice foil. It's, a, it's not too bad, yes, but I've got my stylist. So my wife is, is the, um, my, my stylist. She makes sure I go outside looking fantastic. Okay. If it wasn't for her, I'm sure it'd be jeans and t-shirts today. Which is, which is not bad, yeah. which is, uh, you know, in, unimpeachable. <laughs> it's, it's very relaxing. <laughs> yes, uh, so how have you been these days? No, it's not too, too bad. You know, I, I guess you know, we've all had this COVID issue for the last few weeks, months actually, in the year and a half. Mm -hmm. That's made life a little bit harder for everyone here in Vietnam. Yeah. But uh, I think we, you know, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see the end of it soon. Uh, life will get back to normal and we can enjoy our, our past life again. You've been in Vietnam for quite a while. I can't remember what year. Actually, I'm going up to nine years now in Vietnam already. Nine so, yeah, years. I can't believe it's almost 10 years in, in this country. It's Oh yeah, it's so fantastic. 2012? 2012 I arrived in, uh, in Ho Chi Minh City. So I was down there for a year and a half and I moved to Hanoi in 2014. Yes, uh, because you were superintendent when I was in when, when you were there, when, when you were a good student. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, because uh, Philip knows a fair bit about my uh, uni days, about my past, so hopefully he won't reveal too much. No, no, I'm, I'm sure we'll keep it all a secret. You know, we, we, we don't want to break the illusion. Uh, but you, you're a fantastic student, and it's great that we're here today. Thank you very much. So what brought you to Vietnam? Because uh, I, uh, you know, in my understanding, you had quite an illustrious career when you were in Australia. So what precipitated the move? Oh, it's a great question. And it all came about by chance. Really? So serendipitous. So I was, I was working in a helicopter rescue organization in Australia. That's kind of random. And I, had a, and I was attending a conference in London. Mm. And on the way to London, I had an opportunity to either stay in Singapore for a few days or in Saigon for a few days. And I've never been to Saigon before, so I chose Saigon. Mm -hmm. And my first day in Saigon, it was magical. Really? The city was charming. The people were fantastic. Uh, and I had dinner by myself in District 1 in Ho Chi Minh City. Second day got even better. And then I flew to London for the conference back to Australia. And, and almost immediately I told my wife, we need to move to, to live in Vietnam. It's fantastic. <laughs> so one year later we packed up yeah. and we, we, we moved to Saigon. So may I ask, uh, what city were you residing in before you uh, went to Saigon? Yeah, so before living in Ho Chi Minh City, I was living in Mackay, a small regional town in Queensland. So up mm. near the Barrier Reef in Australia. It's okay. fantastic, famous for its beaches and the, the Whitsunday Islands. So, so it must have been area. quite the contrast from like a, a coastal town in, in uh, Australia yeah. to, you know, the concrete jungle of uh, Ho Chi Minh City. Correct. And the town that we come from, Mackay, the population was 80,000 people. Oh, wow. So it's smaller than the old quarter of Hanoi. Yeah. So this town, but it was over, the town itself is quite large. So it's almost as big as, Ho as Hanoi, yeah. but with only 80,000 people. Yeah. Uh, and then yeah, moving into Ho Chi Minh City with you know, nine or 10 million people there, yeah. the, the traffic, you know, the motorbikes, the cars, the honking, the street food, the people, it was overwhelming, but fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I mean it, it's, uh, you know, either you love it or hate it. And, you know, some people are kind of, you know, too overwhelmed by that really in your face experience. But, you know, I think a lot of people love it and a lot of people chose to stay. And that's the magical thing about Vietnam. What um, brought you to Hanoi? Because, I, I mean, uh, according to what you were telling me, you seem to enjoy Saigon very much. Yeah. So Saigon was fabulous, but I, I came to Hanoi in 2013 for the graduation ceremony of RMIT. Mm. And the, the ceremony in that year was at the Hanoi Opera House. Yeah. And it was beautiful. 
and the Opera House is a fantastic setting. Yeah. And then I, I spent a few days around Westlake, around Juan Kim, and, the, and just the architecture and the beauty of Hanoi, it just captivated me. Yeah. And so I, I asked my boss at that time uh, around any opportunities for Hanoi and she decided yeah, move it to Hanoi and run the campus. So it was just a really a magical time and Hanoi is a beautiful city. Yeah, and it's just, you know, the right time and the right place and yeah. everything kind of worked out yeah. and there was a vacancy in, in the... That's right, yeah, the, 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 head, the head of campus role was, uh, was just made vacant. Uh, and it was just, one of, again, one of those serendipitous times where just fate yeah. opened, the, opened the door and I, I ran through that door. Yeah, you were you were preordained yeah. to be the, the head <laughs> honcho of the Hanoi campus. And here I am, eight years later, I'm still here. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you must you must you must like it here. Yeah, I do. And, yeah. and I've had a wonderful opportunity. I've I've been the president of Austram, the Australian Chamber of Commerce in Vietnam. I was on an advisory board with CPA Australia, the accounting body here in in Hanoi. Mm -hmm. um, I, I meet regularly with the Australian Embassy and have led delegations uh, for trade missions through the country. I, I've just had a really fortunate time here. In, in Vietnam, and it's, it's probably my turn to give back to the country. Yeah, yeah. fantastic to hear. Mm. So, the topic of today's episode, the theme is uh, studying abroad, and uh, from your point of view, what does a student need to prepare prior to coming to a country like Australia to study? Okay, it's a great question, and, and really one of the key things is to have an open mindset. Mm. So, you're leaving home, you're, you're leaving a culture that you're fully aware of. So, you've studied in Vietnam for 12 years, you understand the food, the culture, the country, then you're about to move to a, a foreign country. So you need to actually think about living in, in that city, what's going to be different. You'll have a culture shock in two ways. You'll have a culture shock about studying in a foreign country, and then you'll also have a culture shock about living in that country. So I encourage students to read as, as much as they possibly can, and to watch movies, watch YouTube, try, to, try and absorb as much about that other country as possible. And it's not all about studying at the university, it's actually living in that community. So understand where, where you're going to live, uh, really understand the feeling of living in that country mm -hmm. and, and be aware that you may have homesickness, you, uh, you, you'll, you'll miss your family, you'll miss or, your or buncha, you or, or you will not, you'll, you'll have the best time of your life. You, you, there won't be any buncha, there won't be any banquet, uh, there, there may be no cafe suda. So things will, things will be different. So, and I think, yeah, just to, be prepared for the difference. The first hurdle uh, before coming to Australia is to get admitted to a university in Correct. Australia first. And uh, in my understanding, uh, it's uh, pretty competitive uh, and uh, Australia has some of the best institutions in the world. So do you have any advice for students aspiring to study at one of these institutions? Yeah, great question. And really it's about, to me, a good student is a well-rounded person. Mm -hmm. So your GPA is important, but not the most important. Yes, you'll need an IELTS of 6.5 or 6 to study in Australia. So IELTS is important, but it's also about you as the person. So make sure you're involved in some sporting activities or debating clubs or clubs at your, at your high school or that you're involved in some sort of other community engagement. So try and be a well-rounded person, not just focused on a, a perfect you know, 10 out of 10 GPA or IELTS 9. Yeah. You know, we want everything in a person. And, and that's what I love about Australian education is that it's just so, everything's just so intertwined. And in, like you said, you know, you have all these requirements that, that you need to uh, achieve. Uh, but in Vietnam, people usually uh, compartmentalize that stuff and, and they think they're totally different enterprises. You know, being a good student at school is different from like getting a, a high IELTS score and it's different from like being a very sociable person. But, you know, in an Australian system of education, all these things seems to, they, they have to make sense, you know, and progress in each sphere is going to affect uh, another, you know, and, and that's what's great about Australian yeah. education. And it's one of the sayings at, at RMIT, we have being ready for life and work. And that's when I talk about having a, this well-rounded person. You, going to university, not everyone wants to become a professor. Not everyone wants to study for a PhD. It's really about getting that great job. Mm. So we, Australian universities, when we try and recruit students, we, we're actually preparing you for the workforce. Mm -hmm. And that's why we say we want you to have an IELTS. We want you to have a good GPA, but we also want you to be a well-rounded person. Yeah. So because that's, that's how you'll get a great job when you finish university, by having that well-roundedness. Yeah, it, it makes total sense, you know, given Australia is such a livable country, so you gotta be able to, you know, live to the fullest too. Yep. So, um, I mean, uh, what is your view of uh, Vietnamese students' uh, capabilities? Uh, what are their pros and cons, and how, 
how does that help them get into one of the you know prestigious Australian universities? I, I think Vietnamese students are dynamic. They're, they're highly motivated. One of the things they have to learn when they go to Australia is having critical thinking. So I'm sure here in Vietnam, a lot of the schools, you, you learn by rote. So you just learn by heart. We're, in Australia, we, we want you to challenge. We want you to challenge what you learn. We want you to learn by yourself. So we'll encourage you to go out there and, and read books, watch videos, talk to people, immerse yourself in the community, and you'll learn a lot more. Yeah. We won't give you all the answers. We want you to find the answer. Mm. And that, I think that's one of the challenges for Vietnamese students, that they've been so used to being told the answer, mm -hmm. and we're, we're asking you to, to go find the answer. Mm -hmm. When you go to school in Australia, that's one of the things we'll ask you. What, what's good and bad about this book? What's yeah. good and bad about this article? If you only give the good, you'll only get 30 or 40%. Yeah. We want you to actually tell us the bad parts about it, or how could it be improved? Yeah. That's, why we're getting, that's what Australian education is all about. How can things improve? Challenge the, challenge the norm yeah. and get more out of it. We'll get a chance to chat more with Philip about communication skills in the next segment of the show. But for now, let's see what Khanh Vi is up to in IELTS On The Go. Let's take a break with IFO Facts. September 1st is significant in Australia for two reasons. It is the first day of spring, and it is National Wattle Day. The Golden Wattle is Australian's national flower and appears on the Australian coat of arms. When it blooms, the flower displays green and gold, Australia's national colors. And now be excited for the next part of the show. Thank you so much for joining us, how are you? Hi, I'm good, how are you? I'm very well, thank you for um, joining us once again. <laughs> so of course I do know you, we talk, uh, but could you introduce about yourself a little bit to the audience? Yeah, sure, my name is Dan Chen and I'm a final year student in the University of Melbourne. Um, I'm majoring in marketing and economics and I feel really great to be here with you guys today. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, we, uh, you know, this show is all about Australia, and uh, we are so excited to talk to a lot of you know Vietnamese students who are studying in Australia. Uh, but first, before we get into uh, many talks, we should start with a challenge of I O Stay at Home. Every guest coming here must you know to must go through a challenge, a pretty fun one. Let's go. Uh, so we know that we have different kinds of English. Australian English is beautiful, is interesting. We have collated some words so that you will translate those words to in an, in an, an Australian way. Like, yeah. how do the Australians say this word? <laughs> Got it. All right. Let's start off with the first word, candy. Candy in Australian is lolly. And a funny thing is, Lollies. I love Australian lollies. They are, I love especially those sour gummies. Mm -hmm. They help me to stay concentrated and focused in my final exam season. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Okay, the next word is friends. Friends. Friends in Australia is mates. Like, have you met my mate? Or uh, do you know my mate? He's studying in Melbourne. Kind of thing. Okay. So the final word is afternoon. Oh, afternoon is arvo, like good arvo, good afternoon. Mm -hmm. Good arvo. So yeah, I think you have, you know, completed this challenge very successfully. And I think you understand a lot about Australian culture and Australian language, English <laughs> language. So yeah, thank you. Welcome back to I Have a Stay at Home and we're gonna continue the talk with Dan about a lot of questions about Australia and her journey to study over there. Um, how long have you been living and studying in Australia? I've lived in Australia for one year before I came back because of COVID. Such a shame. You know, but that's a very like that that's enough of time to get to know a country and be used to and familiar with the culture there. Yes. So a common question that we often ask the guest is if you had to pick one place or like one, you know, aspect of the culture of Australia that you really like, then what would it be? I think I have talked to you guys a lot about Australian culture, Barbie and stuff. So I think I would pick a place. Um, I have two places in mind. 
but I guess I will choose the Watson Bay of Sydney. Mm -hmm. uh, before I got back to Vietnam, mm. I got a chance to go on a trip to Sydney with my friends. And one of my friends recommended me mm. this place. And so the Watson Bay is quite big and we walk around a little bit and we saw like four to five beaches before settling down in one beach to watch the sunset. From the Watson Bay, you can see the sunset slowly mm -hmm. and slowly behind the buildings in the central business district of Sydney. And it was really peaceful. It was one of the most peaceful moments in my life. It seems like, like time has just stopped and all you have to do is watch the sun. You don't have anything else to worry about. Ah, oh, very nice. I mean, that must be one of the best memories of you living in, in Australia. Because that sounds so, you know, memorable and fantastic. I would love to try there. You know, you are literally living my dream life because I would love to study you in Australia. Mm -hmm. Like, we will see what happens in the future with the COVID things. <laughs> So let's talk about your, you know, your journey to have a scholarship to study in Australia. So can you tell us more about your, you know, application for a scholarship process and like, how could you make it happen? Um, I guess I start preparing pretty soon, like pretty early, I mean. Um, I've always known that I want to study abroad and it is, it's just my dream. Like I... It was my dream since I was a little kid. And I started to do some research mm. right after I got into my high school. And um, I have, after like a while, I realized that there are two things that I should focus, definitely focus on, which are academic grades and also extracurricular activities. Yeah. Uh, when I managed to choose the country to, to know that Australia is go was going to be my destination, I need to get study, get into study seriously, like give my 100%. And so, because in Australia, it matters a lot, like great matters a lot in your scholarship application. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I have this, I have this like weekly planner that I will have, mm -hmm. I will study for each test that is coming up next week and I allocate different study blocks into yeah, yeah, each day. Mm. So that's some of my, that's, that's a habit that I'm still maintaining now because I have much more responsibility now that I need to keep track of. And also, I guess this is the most valuable thing that I learned from high school. Not like the academic mm. knowledge stuff, but more like the skills, the time management and organizational skills that which helped me a lot in university. You have been working really hard and I think that your hard work really pays off with the very, you know, amazing scholarship. And like, that's a dream of a lot of students out there. Um, so then, regarding language barrier, how was the English that you expected in mind before you came? And how was the real English that you are exposed to? As I mentioned, the Australian slang system is kind of complicated. So they have different words for everything. And I am so used to the American English, right? And sometimes it gets hard to communicate with friends. Even those who are Australian, they try to speak in a like a very slow tone at a very low slow pace for us to keep like keep up with. And also, Australian university have this recording systems. So if you miss anything, just go online and watch the lecture recordings again, and it will help. Uh, it helps a lot. So that's with listening and talking. What about writing so writing is obviously a thing right and right like yes. i was used to writing ielts essay but that's it like i don't really write a lot in vietnam you know and especially i don't have to write like english essay on macro topics um so it was rather hard for me to start writing in university so fortunately my university has this academic tutor tutoring service so i can have my essay proofread by a specialist and another tip when you're going abroad please don't be afraid of asking for help there will always be someone out there to help you with that 
Yes, definitely. Don't be shy. I totally agree. Uh, and then you are very good at English. You speak perfect English. So we just met someone who's trying to win a scholarship but is having a lot of problems with communication skills. And I want to ask you, Philip, uh, I don't think um, Vietnamese students, their grammar is too shabby, but why are they having so, so many issues with speaking? True. So I think they, they learn grammar so well and by rote at university and at high school. But, but speaking isn't natural. And, and I have advice, and a great friend of mine who is a, a leading uh, educationalist in, in, in English language mm. said he has three big tips wow. for students to pick up how to speak better English. And the first big tip is to practice. <laughs> and the second biggest tip is to practice. And the third most important tip I, I is to <laughs> practice. So, and I think just students have to have the confidence to, to speak more uh, and their English language mm -hmm. will, will, will improve. And uh, who is this um, expert friend of yours? Actually, a great friend from Australia, Patrick Pheasant. Um, yeah. He uh, looks after one of the leading accreditation bodies in Australia, NIAS. Um, I think he's joining us on the show today. Yes, and today we'll have a chance to chat with Patrick about uh, what's going to help Vietnamese students conquer their communication skills. Joining us on the IFO set today is Patrick Pheasant. How Hi, are you, Patrick? Patrick? Hi, Tom. Hi, Philip. So, Patrick and I have just discussed uh, a few problems that Vietnamese students, or international students for that matter, may have in improving their communication skills. Do you have any suggestions for them? Yeah, look, that's a, that's a good question. And, you know, I think learning English, it's a lifelong journey, right? Um, uh, it's about uh, doing things uh, in English and studying English hard, but it's also about making mistakes and being brave and being courageous. You know, if you keep on trying and trying again in English, you're certainly going to improve. So I think uh, learning English is a, a lifelong journey uh, and you should always think about what you can improve on and where you can go with your future language learning study. And may I ask what uh, qualifications are currently accepted at uh, Australian institutions? Yeah, well, look, it depends on, um, on your purpose. If you're a student wanting to come to Australia and you want to uh, enjoy the lifestyle and you want to uh, experience the Australian culture, um, it's a really great idea to think about studying general English. Um, however, if you're looking to move into university and you want to study at the university level, uh, you might want to think about uh, studying test preparation courses or um, uh, English for academic purposes or even a direct entry course that allows you to move directly into the university. So I think it's really important to think about your, um, your goal for learning English and then that will impact what type of uh, you know, qualifications or courses that you want to do. Now, if you're interested in being an English language teacher, that's a whole another situation that you have to consider. And, you know, in Australia, we have some really fantastic uh, teacher qualifications. Uh, one of them, uh, you know, being um, the CELTA and also um, our Certificate 4 in, uh, in TESOL. But there's a whole other range of uh, great uh, teacher education programs that you can do. So if you're thinking about becoming an English teacher, there's a lot of opportunity in Australia as well. So I'm sure all of our viewers are familiar with the IELTS because, I mean, it's literally in the name of the show, but not a lot of people are familiar with ELICOS. So could you please explain to us and the viewers what uh, ELICOS is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So in, in Australia, uh, as I mentioned, where we have a, a whole range of, of courses, uh, and something that you know in, uh, we do really well in Australia is our ELICOS courses. Now these are English language intensive courses for overseas students and this is a really great chance to to come to Australia and to learn on campus uh, in a great environment and immerse yourself in, in learning English. These ELICOS courses, our intensive courses, are normally 20 hours per week and they're designed to really throw you in the deep end actually and really give you the opportunity to to practice English in the classroom but also to experience uh, the culture of Australia and learn about uh, you know English in different cultures uh, as you're going about your daily life or as you're enjoying yourself with your friends you can study uh, all of this in the ELICOS programs in Australia. 
We're very proud of our LECOS programs. Uh, Australia has really been uh, innovative and leading the way with our LECOS designs. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you're interested in uh, really immersing yourself into the culture and having that full experience in English, uh, certainly an LECOS program is for you. So I think we can all agree that self-confidence is not necessarily an innate quality that we're born with, but it's something that you have to practice and acquire over time. So do you have any tips for students looking to build up their self-confidence? Yeah, look, great question. Uh, thank you for, for asking that. And, uh, you know, I think, um, I, I think it's really important to, to focus on building your confidence by trying things again and again and again and experimenting uh, and, you know, being curious. I mean, English is like, I guess it's like a, a key, you know, it's a key that opens many doors. Now the more keys that you can get by practicing more and more things in English, the more doors you're going to be able to open. And these might be doors to your career, they might be doors to um, you know, traveling, uh, they might be doors to making international friends. Thank you Patrick for the sage advice. What about you Philip? What do you think about self-confidence and how students can build them up? It's being, the, being yourself. And it takes practice, so it's really hard to, when you have to be, give your first public speech or even speech, speak in front of a classroom. So you speak in front of a mirror, be confident, speak to your family. Uh, it, it just takes practice and, and confidence to really boost, up that, boost that up yourself. So yeah. d don't, don't expect you'll be a great public speaker in your first speech. Just be, be aware it's a learning process. It's like learning to read, learning to walk, learning to cook. Uh, Philip, do you have any advice for students wanting to join Elicos? Students, just look out there, look for the opportunities to actually study Elicos in Australia. Uh, prepare your applications and yeah, be brave. Take that challenge. Go study. Yeah, and that, that's why you're watching this show because, yeah. you know, there are just a lot of opportunities and a lot of resources you can refer to. Uh, and I think Australian, uh, the Australian government's websites and all the official websites from Australia are all great because they're really easy to navigate and they're just packed with information. So they just tick out all the guesswork. That's right. Really want to join programs like these. Yep, so be brave. Take that challenge. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you, Philip. And thank you, Patrick, for joining us on the show. Viewers, I hope that was helpful, but don't go anywhere yet because we're going back to Hangvi with IFO on the go. Let's take a break with IFO facts. Did you know one in four Australian homes have solar panels installed? In fact, Australia is a leader in solar technology and has the highest global uptake of household solar in the world. Australians are early adopters of technology and innovation. It's no surprise that Australia has been one of the first countries in the world where urban drone delivery service has taken off. And now be excited for the next part of the show. Welcome back to IFO Stay at Home. So we just had a talk with Dan about her study in Australia and some tips for students who want to study abroad. And in this session, we're going to talk about learning English, learning language, which I think a lot of you are very interested in. You know, a lot of the audience um, who are the students, uh, high school students, they really want to study abroad just like you. So what would be some advice that like what to do when apply for scholarship to study abroad that you would give the advice for them? I think it would really be helpful if you can reach out to experienced people. They will provide a lot of useful insights, both positively and negatively, about the country and about the course so that you can choose what like fits the most with you and also you will need to prepare mentally and also physically for the environment. Wow, oh, I mean, thank you so much for such detailed and, you know, explanation to study abroad, how to prepare that, very helpful. And I can see the sparkle in your eyes and how passionate you are when you talk about studying in Australia and how to choose school or like courses. Um, I think that journey might be, you know, guys, that journey to apply for scholarship or to study abroad would be very long, would be very tough. but. 
if we have the goals in mind and if we like have the determination to work towards that goals, then nothing can stop us and it will be worth uh, at the end of the day. So yes, just go for it. Can you recall any difficulties or obstacles when applying for scholarship? Um, I guess like apart from the academic knowledge stuff, my the hardest thing that I had to go to mm -hmm. in high school was studying for IELTS. Like, I was so stressful because it, it was so stressful because you know the IELTS fee in Vietnam is like consider it's considered pretty high for Vietnamese like normal wages and stuff and I just have this extremely stress on me that I need to nail this test so that I don't have to retake it because it will put mm. such economic burden on my family. That's right. I think it's, it's a common, you know, difficulty for a lot of students. Uh, and you know, we've already had a challenge in the first part and before this talk ends, you have to go through another challenge, which is my favorite part because I love to challenge guests and make them confused. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Okay, let's try it. All right, here we go. We have four levels of difficulty. Four levels? <laughs> yes, and your punishment will be that um, if you fail, you have to number one, either eat a lemon and say a pickup line in German at the same time because we know that you learn German, or okay. you can wear a headphone and sing a song out loud. Which one do you like? I would pick the one first one. Pick? Yep. Oh, absolutely, okay. it's the first one. So, so you would choose the first one. It's sour food, lemon, and one pickup line in German. All right, here we go. Number one, 25 seconds, three, two, one, start. How much would a woodchuck, wood, how much would, how much would, would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? He could chuck he would as much as he could at, and chuck as much wood as a woodchuck would if a woodchuck could chuck wood. Hmm, excellent. <laughs> Even I don't finish drinking this cup of water, but you already done, so <laughs> you're so good. All right. Um, level two. This is 15 seconds, a little bit more difficult. So three, two, one, let's go. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. A peck of pickled peppers Peter Piper picked. If Peter Piper picks a peck of pickled peppers, where's the peck of pickled peppers Peter Piper picked? Yay! Yeah, 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 impressive. Wow. I don't think this challenge can challenge you, honestly, I would say. Um, okay, now move to number three. It will just take you 10 seconds. Three, two, one, go! If you must cross a course cross cow across a crowd crop cow crossing, cross the cross course cow across the crowd cow crossing carefully. Wait, what? Nine seconds? What is that? Wow! Wait. It took you just 9 seconds to complete uh, this very hard tongue twister. You've made it so well. You made it. Um, I've got to tell the crew that these tongue twisters are a little bit easy for you because you're so good at English. <laughs> okay. All right, the last one of the challenge, number four. Imagine an imaginary manager manager managing an imaginary manager. Yeah. Oh my god, I think the challenge is too easy for you hmm. because you're so good at English. I admire that. Um, so even you win. Congratulations, you won. Uh, we cannot punish you, but we would like to listen to some German songs or any German pickup line that you have in your mind so that we can learn something from it. Is that okay? I mean, sure if you want, but... My my German is really rusty. Like it's been such a long time since I since I touch it. Ich der auf dich. Willst du mit mir gehen? So that that means I like you. Will you go out with me in German? Hey, amazing! I heard that German is one of the hardest languages to learn in the world, and you nailed it. So Dan, you inspired me so much about learning English, studying abroad. Never stop dreaming big and always working towards the goals. 
Um, I love you so much. I really, really adore you, and thank you so much for being on the show.、Um, I wish you every opportunity in the future, full of incredible possibilities. And I would love to see you more on another amazing adventures and being successful, inspiring as you are right now. So thank you so much. Take care, and I hope that we can meet again soon. Thank you so much for having me in this sh- on the show. It was. A great time for me. It was a new experience, and I love it. Okay, love you so much, Dan. And now, please back to the studio of I've O Nile Show. Thank you, Hengvi. And I think the key takeaway here is that if you aspire to study in Australia, yes, the transcript matters and the IELTS score is necessary. But you also need to join some extracurricular activities and you need to hone your soft skills. So, Philip, I would like to ask you: What are some of the activities that、uh, students in Vietnam can get themselves into prior to coming to Australia, just to prepare for that overseas studies experience? Yeah, great question. And the students can do a myriad of things. So it's whether joining a sporting club. A debating club, community events,、uh, participate, helping the poor, joining a charity. There are a lot of things you can do outside the classroom to actually make you that make you that better, well-rounded person. It's not all about learning and reading and writing. It's really going out there and being somewhere, being someone different,、yeah. and looking for other opportunities. Be a leader at a club at the school. Be a leader at a club in the community. You, you need to be something different. All right, thank you, Philip. You、uh, have given us a lot of sage advice today, but、uh, we're going to、uh, exploit your services a little bit longer because coming up next is the Voice of the Week challenge, and you will help us、uh, give feedback to our Voice of the Week contestant. Welcome to IFL Backstage. My name is Kheng Ming, and standing beside me is Nguyễn Ta Dũng, the candidate for Voice of this week. Hello. Hi, Dũng. You don't look nervous at all. So. Are you familiar with、uh, stages? Well, actually, I get so nervous. This is the first time for me being on the show, being on the television.、Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I just try my best to be look not look really nervous. I have to say that you look like as if you are enjoying yourself so much. So,、yeah. uh, what are the preparations for you? I think、um, I think this is very good experience for me. So、mm-hmm. I just take it as. You know, a very new and nice opening experience. So I'm、um, just、uh, try and enjoy. So on a scale from one to ten, and ten is absolute、um, satisfaction from、uh, the host and the guest.、Uh, which score do you think you will get?、Uh, I think it's seven. It's seven. No, I think it will be nine or even nine point <laughs> five for you. Thank you. So say no more. Without further ado, off you go. The floor is yours. Good、Thank、luck. You. Welcome back to the IFO Voice of the Week Challenge. Let's meet today's candidate. Hello, hello. Hi, very nice to meet you, sir. You look dashing. Thank you.、And、judging from your pronunciation, it's going to be a good one for us. <laughs> I hope so. Could you please introduce yourself to the viewers?、Uh, okay, so very n- nice to meet you, sir.、Uh, my name is Nguyen Ta Dung. Currently, I'm a third-year student at Foreign Trade University in Hanoi. Fantastic. Are you ready for the topic for today? I shall be. Okay, so Philip is going to read you the topic of this episode. So good luck with the topic. Yes. So today's topic is learning English in traditional classrooms remains preferred by most parents at present. Should it be changed, and how do you see it changing now? There was one time when I、um, scroll on my Facebook and accidentally I came across a speaking video. It was my nephew, four to five years old. I don't remember exactly. Communicated really well and passionate with his foreign teacher about the daily subjects such as colors, such as animal.、Uh, they recorded the video for the final term test, and frankly speaking, I was super amazed by how well and how confident his English was. I remember back to the time when I was his age. I don't even know what English meant to me. I even thought that Vietnamese was the universal language that everybody on earth would use it. At this moment, I realized that. The、uh, way of teaching English for the children has been changed really dramatically in my hometown as well as in Vietnam in general. And I came to realize that the ability to use English of the children had been cultivated so well by the support of their parents, of their environment, and their education system. So why changing the way of teaching English is really important? I want to share to. 
I want to share with you two stories. The first one, when I was in the secondary school, I was a typical English learner in my hometown. I was trying my best to learn by heart every little uh, new words that I have. I try to remember all the grammar uh, structure in order to pass the oral test at the beginning of the test. And I must say that I didn't really remember and I didn't know what I am doing at that time. And even now, as a consequence, at, at that time, I feel like I can communicate with others. And I really regret about it. The second story, when I was a freshman at university, I also had chances to communicate with people from different backgrounds from me, from different color, different culture, different lifestyle, and therefore it helped me to broaden my mind so much. So from my own experience, I believe that the changing in the way of teaching English will help students feel more interested in that language. I strongly believe that the students should learn English as not as a subject at school, but as a language, as a tour to communicate, uh, to serve the bigger purpose, such as sharing and empathizing with others. And the final words, I believe that if English were taught in a very open and interactive way, the next generation will benefit so much from it as my nephew. Thanks for your attention. Fantastic. Uh, Philip, what do you think about our uh, candidate today? And could you uh, give him some comments, some feedback? Yeah, it's a really good t topic. I love how you actually brought personality to the question. You use the, the, um, the example yes. from your family to, to how to improve. Uh, and you're right, um, learning language should be just a natural thing. Um, you were saying that in the past you, le you learned perfect through grammar. Yes. And, uh, as you can tell by my, my English language, grammar is not my strong point. I, 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 I don't use grammar structure. Yes. When I'm th I don't think about grammar when I'm speaking. Yes. It has to be natural. And, yes. and I, I like the way that you've, you've used uh, your experience in the past of being learning by rote, learn through grammar, yes. and now to, 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 to try and now to learn to be a more of a natural English natural. speaker. Yes. So, so a question for me is then, you've done a great presentation, but, and this is for the, the people at home, the presentation was fantastic, but have you done a lot of practice to get to where you are today? Or is it just a natural way of speaking? I have practiced uh, for this presentation because I want to bring the best on the television. Um, yeah, however, I am feeling a little bit nervous today, so it's not as excellent as I thought it would be. But actually, it's what Tong and I talked about before too, that it's all about, everything's about practice, whether it's golf or, or speaking. Yes. So it's fantastic that you actually practiced before you came today. Yeah. Because nothing's perfect, and I'm sure you'll go home tonight and you'll go, I wish I did this better, I wish I did that better. But for me, the, the greatest thing you did today was that you actually tried. Yes. And you, you actually attempted to do something that most people would find quite difficult. So congratulations that you did that great presentation. I hope to see you again at the end of the season and that's where you will get a chance to win a lot of amazing goodies, lots of enticing prizes, and maybe a chance to go to Australia, I don't know. So hopefully we'll see each other again at the end of the season. Thank you so much. Great, good luck, well done. Thank you. Yeah. Our show today has drawn to a close. I've had a fantastic time chatting with an old mentor of mine, Mr. Philip Dowler. And I hope you guys have gained some wonderful insight into how to best prepare for your new life in Australia as an international student, how to acclimatize to a new culture, and what you can do in addition to a sterling transcript and a good IELTS score to increase your chances of being admitted to one of the more prestigious Australian institutions. My name is Tung Dang. This is the IFO Nightly Show. Thank you for watching. Good night. Today's word is sandal. Sandal, sandals in Australia is thongs. And you know, thongs have a very different meaning in the US. Yeah, <laughs> about McDonald's. McDonald's in Australia is macas. Like, you want to go get some macas? Barbecue. Barbecue is Barbie. Barbie like the doll, Barbie doll. But yeah, do you wanna go, uh, do you wanna have some Barbie this weekend? Or I'm going out for Barbie with my friends. Three, two, one, go. 
So uh, thank you uh, for being here. So after the fascinating uh, talk with uh, our host, Tung Dang, uh, I would like to know uh, more about your feelings, such as like uh, you had just had a conversation with uh, one of the alumni of RMIT. So how do you feel? It's a, it's a proud moment to actually see one of your alumni move through from being a student mm -hmm. to now being a TV presenter. It's a great outcome for, for RMIT and for me personally. Uh, it's, it's the transition from being a young student now to this kind of well-respected and, and well-known person in the community, it just makes me feel fantastic. And one of the reasons mm -hmm. you want to become an educator. Well, uh, he is just one of the typical examples of the success stories of RMIT alumni. That may be a motivation for some, but some other students may think that uh, RMIT and, uh, and, and the image that it's creating is just beyond their league. So what do you have to say to them? No, please try. And there, there's more than one way to get into RMIT. We have a, mm -hmm. a myriad of scholarships. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so look into our, into our scholarship program. Each year we accept around 100 students mm -hmm. through our scholarship programs. Um, try, mm -hmm. apply, and, and try and study at RMIT. I really encourage you to look for other, other opportunities. Yeah. So let's turn in some, uh, to some uh, personal questions. Oh, I know you're um, a man like you, like uh, in your position, uh, so busy with your work, your hectic schedule and stuff. So, um, what is your favorite way to kick back and relax in Hanoi? For, for me, there's a few ways. I, I love the food of Hanoi mm -hmm. and I love the coffee of, of the city. So, often on the weekend, I'll have a banquet near my house and mm -hmm. then go for a coffee on Westlake or Info Island. Mm -hmm. uh, just absorb the, the coffee culture of the city, read a book and relax mm -hmm. and unwind. It's a fantastic city. Yeah. Those activities may seem a little uh, limited during the uh, situation of COVID-19 um, social distancing. Yeah. So um, is that a big problem for you? Well, at the moment, yeah, it's a little bit hard. We have to adapt. We have to learn to do something differently. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, during COVID, we can't do, we can't explore the city or the country or the world as much as we can. So, we need to look at different things. So, whether it's reading a book at home, exercising at home, I'm mm -hmm. sure all the exercise apps are now getting a crazy workout. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think we just need to adapt and, and change. Yeah, excellent. So, uh, there are many questions that I want to ask you, but um, I think uh, let's save it for next time. Okay. Sure, I'd love to come back. Okay. Okay. Thank you again. Thanks, Ming. Okay. okay. Welcome back to Vocabulary Highlights of IFO Nutley Show. You're with me, Kheng Ming, and let's see what words have been selected today. When Tung Dang first met with Mr. Philip Dowler on the show, he said they used to rub shoulders quite a bit. That means they used to meet or spend time with each other. I never had a chance to rub shoulders with Keanu Reeves, my favorite Hollywood star. Tung Dang commented, that Mr. Dowler had quite an illustrious career. That adjective means famous, well-respected, and admired. He also asked our guest what precipitated the move. The move here refers to Mr. Dowler's moving to Vietnam. The verb precipitate is to make something happen suddenly or sooner than expected. This word is stressed on the second syllable precipitate. One simple synonym of to live in is to reside in. As Tung Dang asked, what city were you residing in? My favorite Tung Dang quote for this episode is, self-confidence is not necessarily an innate quality. An innate quality or ability is one that you were born with, not the one you learn. And the word that troubles me the most is serendipitous. This is an adjective and it means by chance. This word is not easy to pronounce. Serendipitous, five syllables with stress on the third. He also says something that we should keep in mind. A good student is a well-rounded person. Now. A well-rounded person has experience in a wide range of fields. As a teacher, I do think that we should not learn by road, or to learn something just to repeat it from memory without really understanding it. Our second guest Patrick Fesson advised us to be courageous. In other words, we should all be brave. 
And that is for episode 4. Don't forget to hit like, share and subscribe for more amazing content of IFO Season 7. I'm Khang Ming and until next time.